All right, so with me I have a very special guest, Dr. Weston Childs. And uh, Dr. Childs, he's a former osteopathic physician that focuses on helping people with thyroid problems, weight gain, and hormone imbalances. He takes a functional medicine approach to these systems and believes that everyone, regardless of their hormone status, can get back to feeling 100% using a combination of natural and medical therapies. And welcome, Dr. Childs. Thanks, Eric. I'm uh, glad to be here. For those who maybe don't know, uh, we had uh, Eric on my uh, podcast previously, so this is our second time chatting, and the first time it was awesome, so I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you, Weston. And why don't we start out by discussing how you started helping people with thyroid conditions? Sure, I'd love to do that. So yeah, in full disclosure, as, uh, as you probably mentioned, I'm not practicing now. Um, I originally went to an osteopathic medical school and came out and my started really in radiology, then moved to internal medicine. This is when I was practicing. And when I first came out, I knew I was going to do something related to hormones and something related to weight loss. In fact, really weight loss was really the thing that I was most interested in at the time. And then also what I wanted to do was focus on like menopausal type stuff and hormone replacement therapy and that sort of setting. And as I came out, I was actually working with a couple chiropractors. Um, and so uh, when I first came out, that's where I was. And they just kept sending me patients that they couldn't uh, get all the way better who needed, they, they you know, they would do what they could, they would use supplements, they use diet, they use lifestyle and so on. But some, some of these patients needed thyroid medication. So they would send these patients to me. Um, and I just sort of learned a lot just in practicing and helping these people uh, get better. And so I started to use things and I found out certain things didn't work. So I'd start with, you know, level thyroxine and synthroid, which is what I was taught. I'd add nature thyroid or, or armor thyroid, to, you know, NDT. Then, you know, that would help some people, but not others. And then I'd be like, well, let's combine T3. So cytomel, lyothyronine. So I just sort of stepwise just added more and more uh, therapies and we were able to really help these people uh, who otherwise weren't able to get to get help from either uh, their conventional doctors their endocrinologists or their family practice doctors and so as a result it just sort of grew from there right once you help a couple of people you just start attracting people like crazy and so there were just so many thyroid patients that would come and so in a way i, I kind of joke and say that um you know I, I they they i was sort of attracted to that field but out of necessity it was because there was just so there was such a void that needed to be filled in that area with thyroid management and nobody was doing it. And so that's really what happened. So I, I really got interested in that. And it because the thyroid is so integral into the uh, the systems in the body, including your metabolism and other hormone systems, it it w allowed me to do the things I wanted to do anyway. So I had I was able to help a lot of patients who had low thyroid function and Hashimoto's they, because weight gain is a, one of the main symptoms of that. So I'd help these people lose weight. And so I learned a lot about um, weight loss doing that. And then they also, you know, these people still, these people still had issues with estrogen and progesterone, so they needed bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and so on. So that's really sort of how I got into it. And then from there, I started my blog, started doing videos, started doing podcasts, and then, you know, here we are. Then how long ago was that where you started your, your website, your blog? Yeah, I know I look pretty old, but it was just 2015. 2015. Okay, great. Yeah, so I've been doing this about five, six years. All right, wonderful. All right, so we're gonna chat about supplements and it's mm -hmm. probably a good idea to start off by letting everyone listening know that, you know, it's, supplements are, are important. They can play a big role in helping someone regain their health and feel mm -hmm. better. But of course we wanna always start with diet and lifestyle and I'm sure you would agree with that. Yeah, for sure. So I think when we talk about supplements, which is really what we're gonna be talking about today, I wanna maybe zoom out a little bit and say, when, we, when I was, looking at thyroid patients and probably when, when Eric is looking at thyroid patients, you have a lot of different therapy options available to you. And really supplements are just one bucket. Now, having said that, I think that supplements provide a lot of benefit because they're something that you have control over. Right? And what I mean by that is they're not gated by a prescription pad. You don't need to go to your doctor to say, um, because if you want to, let's say, switch from level thyroxine to synthroid or level thyroxine to tyrosine or level thyroxine to armor thyroid, you can't do that on your own. Your doctor needs to prescribe that for you, right? But when it comes to supplements, you have the option to kind of mix and match things. You can you can play around with them. So you do have a lot of uh, autonomy using over-the-counter supplements, which is why I'm really attracted to that field. But as Eric was saying, these are, you know, as the name implies, they're supplements. They're not meant to be used in isolation. They're supplements to whatever else you are doing. So as we're as we're talking about supplements, we'll be going really deep into those supplements themselves. But just remember that, yeah, it's part of a complete therapy system, right? So you're going to have diet, you're going to have supplements, you're going to have medications, hormones, whatever that may be, lifestyle, stress reduction, improved sleep. So this is just one element of, you know, many different buckets that need to be, that you need to look at in terms of treatment. I'll also add one other thing here, and that is when possible, I always think it's best to get your nutrients, which is really what supplements are providing. Um, you get vitamins, you get nutrients, you can get botanicals as well, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. But 
whenever possible, you want to get as many nutrients as you can from the foods that you're consuming. Now, a lot of the times that may not be possible, especially if we're talking about soil depletion of certain nutrients. So um, the food that we're consuming, just they don't have as much nutrients as they once did. And so in that case, it makes sense to supplement, you know, and in other cases, it makes sense to supplement because some foods that are just really rich in certain nutrients and vitamins, they may not be palatable to you. You may not like to eat those, or you may not want to consume seaweed or, or certain types of food if you're looking for iodine every single day. Maybe you don't want to consume oysters every day because you, you want to get your zinc elsewhere. So you have to kind of play around with all these things together. But I do think that supplements have a really important role in the treatment of a lot of thyroid patients and can provide a lot of benefit, but they should not be looked at in isolation. You want to look at them, as we mentioned, as part of a whole treatment plan. So I definitely agree with your statement. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. So let's, let's go ahead and dive into the supplements. So what are some of the more common supplements that you recommend? Yeah. As well. So are we talking about Hashimoto's patients? Are we talking about hypothyroid patients, Graves disease patients? Like what kind of, what kind of, what were you thinking? Well, I was thinking that, I mean, or just general. I, yeah. I, well, we could do it either way. We could go uh, just focus first on the hypothyroid Hashimoto's patients and then hyperthyroid Graves. And, you know, I'm sure there's some that are better suited for those with Hashimoto's, some that are better mm -hmm. suited for those with hyperthyroidism and those that could benefit both. So, yeah. but I, I'm open however you want to start. If you want to start by focusing on one condition, that's fine. If you want to start by discussing supplements that would benefit those with both Hashimoto's and Graves, I'm, I'm cool with that. Okay, yeah, let's let's start, I guess, and say this. So the way that I think about supplementation, as I mentioned previously, um, the, one of the main benefits to using supplements is you have the option to sort of manipulate and fine tune what nutrients you're using to try and obtain some specific purpose. Okay, and so a lot of there's a lot of different ways to look at supplements and how to use them. That's how I think about it. So when I'm thinking about thyroid patients, I'm really looking at them and saying, okay, what sort of thyroid problem do you have? Do you have, because it's not always obvious, or you might think to yourself, I have Graves disease, therefore I have hyperthyroidism, therefore my thyroid is actively hyperthyroid, which isn't always the case, right? And uh, for instance, you could be taking an excessive dose of methimazole, which is blocking your thyroid beyond that which would be normal. So you could go from hyperthyroid to low thyroid, in which case maybe there's some room for improvement there, okay? Likewise, imagine you are somebody who has hyperthyroidism. Let's imagine that you had your thyroid ablated or surgically removed via thyroidectomy. Well, you're, even though you retained it, or even though you were previously diagnosed as hyperthyroidism, once your thyroid is removed, you're more in the hypothyroid camp than you are in the hyperthyroid camp. So you kind of have to think about what is your current thyroid status, when, and then you can kind of determine what sort of supplements that you want to use at that point. So that's really how I'm thinking about it. So we'll talk about supplements to boost thyroid function. We'll talk about supplements to improve the immune system. We can talk about supplements which would be beneficial for Hashimoto's and Graves. And then there's even supplements which may make those conditions worse. Now on the same, you know, on the flip side, there's also a lot of supplements which are just important for general health, right? So we can kind of talk about those, I would say more broadly, and then we can kind of dive into these these other areas more specifically as we need to. But I would say for general health, um, zinc would be would be a really good one. I would look at magnesium because that tends to be depleted in a lot of people, especially with related to stress. We got all the B vitamins, including B12 especially. These tend to be depleted in, in stressful situations. And they also tend to be impacted by those people who have thyroid function due to how the thyroid impacts the metabolism and how these are excreted or retained inside of either the via the kidneys or inside of the intestinal tract. So B vitamins, zinc, magnesium, and I would include in there vitamin D, although I think also that has relevance when it comes to autoimmune diseases as well. So I could kind of put that in both Graves um, and Hashimoto's. But I would say those are sort of the basics. Now, these are more related to vitamins and nutrients and not necessarily botanicals. So I do want to kind of separate the two of those things together. So botanicals would be when you are extracting a specific um, element of a plant or something like that. So in the case of like, let's say ashwagandha, this is an adaptogen. Um, we talked about, maybe we'll talk about berberin as well, but berberin is a plant alkaloid. So you can actually take these specific uh, elements of plants, pound them up, um, crush them up, put them in a capsule form and take those to obtain some sort of benefit as well. So you really have vitamins, you have nutrients, you have minerals, we have iodine, and then we have botanicals and herbs. So kind of which ones you'd use and, and when you need them sort of depends on the situation, your thyroid status. But I would say as a general rule of thumb, those are really the ones that you probably want to be taking um, almost every day. In fact, I would also include in there probiotics, potentially even omega-3 fatty acids. So these are sort of the more general um, supplements that you'd want to consider taking on a daily basis if you have any thyroid problem. Now, if you have a specific thyroid problem, we can kind of go down that route as well, depending on which one which one uh, you're thinking. Okay. So, and if keep, keeping in mind, of course, Graves and Hashimoto's are autoimmune conditions. Right. So really what, so what both of those conditions, if I'm understanding correctly, they could take any of those supplements that you, 
that you just mentioned, correct? That's that's how I view it. Yeah. So I, I would say that these are just supplements. The ones that I mentioned previously, they're just for generalized health. Um, they're just to improve your improve your health. And when you look at patients, um, due to factors that I talked about previously, these are patients that really, I mean, if you even took any random sampling of the uh, somebody from the United States, these are people that would benefit from using those type of supplements, at least in my opinion, which is why they're included in a lot of multivitamins. And when you look at statistics, there's something like 68% of people, adults in the United States are taking supplements in some form. So obviously they believe that supplements provide some benefit, otherwise 68% would not be uh, buying them and purchasing them and using them on a really frequent basis. Now, I think where you get into some, uh, maybe some contradictions are how conventional doctors view supplements and, and then versus how I think integrative and uh, physicians, functional medicine practitioners, et cetera, how they view supplements. So I think you can kind of talk about those from two different angles there as well. So it gets a little bit more complicated, but the gist is that at least from my perspective, most uh, endocrinologists, most conventionally trained people who are or doctors who are treating thyroid conditions, they tend to be against supplements, right? And we can talk about which ones and why, especially iodine, that's a very controversial topic. Whereas the integrative and more holistic and more functional uh, practitioners, they tend to be very pro supplements. And I think that's probably because they've seen how beneficial and effective they can be, and probably because they've used them personally. And I would say in my own situation, dealing with my own personal health problems previously before I started practicing even, I found supplements to be incredibly effective, more so than even prescription medications, at least for my particular or specific instance. So it's kind of hard to argue with somebody that supplements don't work or, or that they don't have enough um, scientific data to support them when it, it's clear that a lot of people experience benefits when using them. So that, I just want to kind of put that in the background there in terms of context. Yep. And I agree. Uh, when, uh, as you know, I was diagnosed with Graves disease and of course diet lifestyle played a huge role, but mm -hmm. I did take supplements and I think yeah. they also played an important role in my recovery. And yeah. same thing when I work with patients uh, without question, if I had to choose one thing, it would be diet and lifestyle over the supplements, but, sure. uh, but ideally both. So I would recommend for them to, uh, of course, do everything they can from a diet and lifestyle perspective, eat well, manage your stress, sleep, you know, get, get sufficient sleep, but supplements do also play, play an important role. So yeah, I think we're on the same page with that. Yeah. And so let's, let's, why don't we start with low thyroid function though? Okay. So specifically, what are some of the supplements if someone has, you know, uh, overt hype, low, overt low thyroid hormone levels or subclinical hypothyroidism? Sure. So I would say when it comes to somebody who has low thyroid function, really, I, I want to kind of distinguish that we're talking about somebody who has an insufficient amount of thyroid hormone in their body, meaning they're experiencing the symptoms of low thyroid function. And the reason I'm harping on that is because, again, you can have people with hyperthyroidism experience these symptoms. Okay, It's not specific just to people who have been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or hypothyroidism. We're talking specifically what is happening at the cellular level. Are your cells being uh, impacted by thyroid hormone sufficiently to improve or to cause the effects that you want thyroid hormone to do. Now, if that is not the case, there are certain supplements that you can take potentially to augment how well that thyroid function is working. And so I kind of think of that in three broad categories. So we can help with thyroid hormone production. We can actually help the thyroid gland produce more thyroid hormone by providing the necessary building blocks that the thyroid needs to produce those hormones. Okay, so we're just providing it what it needs so it can allow that to occur. Then we can talk about thyroid conversion which is you can take supplements to support the conversion of T4 to T3, which is essentially saying, okay, even if you have your thyroid hormone produced from the thyroid gland, it's not going to work unless it's converted from the inactive form T4 to the more biologically active form T3. T4 does have some biological activity, just to, you know, uh, just to say that. And then lastly, you can talk about supplements which help um, thyroid hormone cellular sensitivity. So we're saying not only does the thyroid gland have to be produced, from the thyroid gland, it must also be converted from T4 to T3, and it must be then, uh, your cells must then be sensitized to it so that it can actually function. And in each of these categories, we have different sets of supplements which work. So I'll kind of go over those, and if you wanna talk about any more in detail, just let me know. So when it comes to thyroid hormone production from the thyroid gland, we're really looking at tyrosine, we're looking at iron, which is important for thyroid peroxidase, and of course, iodine. So these three nutrients, not really vitamins per se, um, because some are elements and whatnot, but but those three nutrients are absolutely required for thyroid hormone production inside of the thyroid gland. So when you take these things, you're basically saying, look, I'm providing the body with the necessary building blocks that it can then take to then produce more thyroid hormone. And a lot of people, not so much in, in the case of, of tyrosine. Tyrosine is a, an amino acid, so it comes from a lot of food. So most people are not tyrosine deficient. That's not usually something that you see. However, I will say that 
people who are supplementing with tyrosine do tend to see improvement in terms of thyroid hormone production. And I believe that's probably because there's some competition between the use of tyrosine between the adrenal gland and the thyroid gland, which both use it for the production and the building blocks of hormones. So I do see benefit from using tyrosine, even though people are gr not grossly deficient in tyrosine. That's not something that, that you, uh, you see very often. However, you do frequently see uh, iodine deficiency and you also see suboptimal iron levels. So iron is required for the activation of a certain enzyme, uh, which actually is involved in the production of thyroid hormone. So you need that iron to, in order for that enzyme to function. And I find that because of how the thyroid, especially low thyroid, impacts the absorption of iron in the intestinal tract, there are a ton of thyroid patients who are iron deficient, or at least have suboptimal iron levels, such that these enzymes are not functioning at 100%. It's not like they're turned off. Instead of instead, think about think of it this way. Think about, about them running at maybe 80%, 85% of normal instead of 100%. So you just have a slight drag on the efficiency of that system because there's a suboptimal level, not a gross deficiency per se. And so that's why I say you have to check um, ferritin. I'm, you're probably, I don't, uh, a big proponent of, of checking that, I would say, on your on your standard lab tests, iron studies and ferritin. At least that's one of my recommended um, uh, lab panels for thyroid patients is to check that iron. You have to, because if you don't, it's like, what, it doesn't matter what you do at, at the farther end because you're just not going to see the success there. Yep, so we I, have, I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, so, uh, ferritin, very, very important. If you have not had your ferritin checked as well as your iron studies, make sure that you guys are doing that. If you're listening to this and you're suffering from low thyroid function. So that was tyrosine. That was, uh, iron. was iron. Thank you. I was thinking of tire. I was thinking of iodine, which is the next one. And that was the one I was, uh, uh, left for last because this is a whole other topic by itself, but, uh, maybe we'll got, dive into that if you want to do that, Eric, but let me just say before we do that, that, I, iodine is also, of course, required for thyroid hormone production. It is really, it, I, I say it forms the arms and the legs of the thyroid hormone molecule. That's kind of how I think about it. And essentially, when we describe thyroid hormones, we describe them as T4 or T3. And that annotation of the number four and number three describes how many iodine molecules are on top of that, that compound. So that hormone is either biologically active or inactive or turns into reverse T3 based off the configurations of those iodines. Clearly, if you don't have enough iodine, which a lot of people don't, and we'll probably talk about that in a second here, then you're not you're gonna have a problem producing enough thyroid hormone. So from the thyroid hormone perspective, those are the three, or the production perspective, those are the three nutrients that I'd recommend that are probably the most important. We can talk about conversion and, and maybe um, cellular sensitivity here in just a minute as well, but I don't know if you wanna dive into iodine a little more in detail, but those are that's kind of how I'm breaking it down mentally in my head. Sure, we could talk more about iodine. So with iron so i agree with you once again ferritin i like to see you know serum iron iron saturation tibc yep. how about with iodine though do you do you recommend testing like doing a urinary test or a blood mm -hmm. test for iodine great question so uh generally no um and i'll i'll explain why so there are a number of ways to test iodine we probably won't get into those testing methods but i think one of the more accurate one is the 24 hour uh, urine testing, or at least the iodine load, or the iodine loading test, right? That's probably the most accurate of all all of the available methods. However, the controversy surrounding iodine is sort of whether or not iodine is dangerous or potentially harmful to those people who have thyroid function or, or who have thyroid problems, either Graves' disease or even Hashimoto's or even just hypothyroidism in general. And part of that loading test requires taking relatively high doses of iodine. So if you're if you're in a camp that says I think iodine is potentially dangerous and yet you're giving somebody a high dose to then test it, well, then you kind of put yourself in a little bit of a pickle. Now, a one-time dose is probably not going to cause a problem. We probably both agree there. Um, but you kind of have to think about these things uh, as well. So not only that, but that, that, that particular test is also potentially difficult to do, right? It requires a lot of patient compliance. It's a little bit of a nuisance. It's a little bit of annoying. Uh, it's a little bit expensive. And, and then you kind of, you're kind of left with, what do I do with the results afterwards? So I, I don't recommend it for those reasons. However, I also recommend starting with physiologic doses of iodine as supplementations. So I think if you were going to say, I am a proponent of higher doses of iodine, and we can kind of talk about that if you, I don't know how deep you want to get into the iodine rabbit hole here, but the way I think about it is because iodine is physiologically necessary for humans, they cannot produce it, right? Which means you must be getting either from your diet or you must be getting from supplement form. That's just how the physiology works. You need it. Therefore, if I'm supplementing with a dose that is within the RDA, then I feel comfortable recommending that dose to somebody, whether or not I know what their actual testing is. But I would say if you are somebody who's ordering or recommending higher doses of iodine in the range of, let's say, 
six to 12 and a half milligrams or higher, I do think it's probably incumbent upon you to check and make sure that that person can actually handle that, or at least try a lower dose to make sure that you're not potentially making that problem worse. So that's why I'm not a super huge fan of iodine testing. I think that it does make sense in certain situations, but I do feel comfortable just recommending low doses of, you know, the physiologic dose range of about, let's say hundred to 250 micrograms, depending on the person per day in supplement form or via uh, foods. And I don't think you see an issue with that. And I'll support that by saying there are tons of foods that have iodine in them that most people have no idea have iodine in them. You know, eggs, deli meat, strawberries, you know, milk, all these things have iodine in them, tuna, et cetera. And you're consuming a lot of these things probably on a daily basis. And if you haven't had an, a negative experience, the chances are you're probably doing okay with iodine, um, at least at that dose range. Furthermore, I have, last I looked, it was something like 80,000 bottles of supplements sold with, with um, iodine in them. And so we're talking, I have a huge database of, you know, 80,000 now patients who have used iodine and very, very, very small numbers of people who actually have problems with iodine, especially at those doses. And I can't even think of, you know, more than a couple off the top of my head. So I think that when you're talking about these lower doses, I think it's safe, especially given the food situation and given the problems related to testing. So I don't know if you want to dive into any of those particular things in more detail. I just sort of brushed over a lot of them because as I said, we could probably talk all day on iodine if we really wanted to. But so, yeah, that's why I don't recommend iodine, routine iodine testing, I'll say. Okay. No, thanks for sharing. And and I agree. I, I know there are some practitioners who tell both people both with Hashimoto's and Graves strictly 100% avoid the iodine. Right. And I, I, I agree that most people just taking, you know, normal doses of iodine and not getting into the, the milligram doses right. are usually not going to have a problem. And, you know, to be fair, there are some people who take higher doses of iodine and they rave about it. And, yep. and, and I'll admit, I was one of those people years ago. I had experience with the higher dose iodine, followed mm -hmm. Dr. David Brownstein. And, you know, so I had a positive experience. So I was recommending iodine to most of my patients, like the higher doses, doing the iodine loading test, yeah. uh, which again, I can't say I, I, I do that routinely now. Yeah. Uh, if I do testing, I'll do more of like the spot test for the reason yeah. you mentioned, because you know the, the iodine loading test involves a 50 milligram uh, dose. tablet of the potassium iodide. So, and, and you just never know how someone's gonna handle it. Yeah, so I, I agree, lower doses of iodine. Some people feel uncomfortable taking iodine as part of a multivitamin, which, right. you know, as you mentioned, you know, would be like anywhere from 75 micrograms to maybe up to 200 micrograms in some cases. Right. And rarely, I mean, there's always gonna be exceptions they will, they'll, 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 with anything that someone takes. So, so I agree, I think iodine is, I mean, it's not just an opinion. Obviously iodine is important. Right. And, now, there is a different perspective when it comes to hyperthyroidism and Graves, because as you mentioned, with hypothyroidism, with low thyroid hormone, you know, it's important. I, and not that not, not, that's the cause of all, you know, like with Hashimoto's, arguably it's the low thyroid hormone is caused by the immune system damaging thyroid gland. And maybe, you know, iodine isn't as important in that situation. Mm -hmm. But if someone does have a deficiency and, and, and you know, then of course, eventually you want to address it. But I mean, even in graves, I'll be honest, I'm not afraid of giving a multivitamin with Norma, yeah. with, with, with iodine in there. And, you know, if someone ha does happen to have a reaction, it's usually not severe with such a low dose. And of course they could just stop taking it. Uh, again, the higher doses, it's a different story. You know this, and I'm just saying it for those people listening, but you know, previously, one of the treatments for Graves' or hyperthyroidism even was high doses of iodine, right? That block the uptake of, and the, for the production yep. of thyroid hormones. So this is, this used to be a therapy uh, back in the day. And so clearly there's something about iodine that's therapeutic in the, in the setting of hyperthyroidism and, and even hypothyroidism, as we just mentioned previously. So it, it's really hard to come up with any definitive statement, but it, it just gets, I think from the perspective of the patients, it gets a little confusing because you have people who are, you know, adamantly against it adamantly for it. And then you have people who are adamantly for, in, you know, really, really high doses of it. So you just have this wide variety of opinions. And I think patients are swimming through it and they're just like, what, what is the actual answer? And, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's, it's really an individualized thing. And that's how I look at it. And if you're not sure what to do and you're afraid of causing any problem, then get that one-on-one -on -one help that you're talking that, you know, that, we, that a lot of people provide like you do, Eric, or, or you know, anybody else for that matter, that's local to you if you need it, uh, because they can help sort through a lot of these things. But my opinion is that most people, and I think we agree on this, most people taking that, that physiologic dose range, I think they're going to be fine. 
and that's just been my experience and i don't think that's a problem now if you want to start using it for therapeutic purposes meaning you want to start potentially blocking uh thyroid hormone production from the thyroid gland and you want because you're trying to stay off of the more prescription prescriptive medications such as bethimazole um, or ptu though that's not used very often then you probably want a practitioner to help you guide you through that process um, likewise if you want to use higher doses for hypothyroidism because you're trying for detoxification of of elements and things like that well then i would probably get some help with that but the general normal physiologic day doses i think my personal opinion is that it's probably okay to use and you should really not see significant harm especially if it's combined or taken with selenium and you don't have any issues there which again we could talk about if we want to go deeper into that yeah i well i, I do want you to discuss conversion but okay. one other thing i'll mention is if someone doesn't want to take methimazole or if they are unable to take methimazole if they've taken it and they you know experience some si type of side effect which is common with the antithyroid medication then typically i'll recommend not the high dose iodine but buga weed which right. is an herb with antithyroid properties and you know, that's what I took. And there's a, you know, I have another episode that focuses on bugleweed and motherwort. So we won't get really deep into that, mm -hmm. but there are other options other than taking high dose iodine, even if someone is unable to take the antithyroid the medication. For sure. And I, I, yeah, my, my, my totally, I agree with that. I, I would say my greater point is definitely don't do that on your own though. I think you want to be guided by someone like you, if you're going to try to take that approach, you know, if you're, if you're trying to take yourself off methimazole in favor of more alternative medications, I would, Definitely not recommend you do that on your own. Definitely do that with the assistant. Bugleweed, motherwort, a high dose of iodine, et cetera. Whether, you know, whichever one you and your practitioner just decide on. So yeah, I, I think we're on the same page there. Yep. All right. So let's dive into conversion problems. Okay. So conversion, again, this is a really important thing uh, for thyroid, especially low thyroid function. And also I would say understanding the conversion process is still important for those people with hyperthyroidism because this conversion process is still, it's the, it's a process by which your body essentially takes a slightly biological, biologically active form of thyroid hormone, usually in the form of T4 and converts it to either a very biologically active thyroid hormone T3 or an inert and blockading sort of uh, hormone in RT3 or reverse T3. So this conversion process is very important for all types of thyroid hormones. So I just, from a physiologic perspective, a thyroid patient should definitely understand this process. Now, when it comes to low thyroid function, a lot of thyroid patients have a problem with that converting, taking T4 to T4, or I'm sorry, T4 to T3. When it comes to hyperthyroidism, most people are taking that T4 to RT3. So it's a completely different pathway, but it's it's it goes down the fork, right? So you can kind of think about it in that way. We're trying to accelerate down this path if you have low thyroid function. And there are a number of nutrients that you can do that with, including zinc, selenium, and I would include in there gugglesterone or guggle extract, as well as pretty much anything that reduces inflammation. Because we know that, that uh, inflammation as a process um, infections, anything that stimulates the immune system and goes down that pro-inflammatory pathway will reduce the conversion of T4 to T3. So what you can do is you can take these supplements and it just so happens that a lot of patients when it comes to hypothyroid patients need more zinc, they need more selenium generally. Now that's just been my experience for most people. That's not universally true. It's certainly not necessarily always the case, especially in the, with when it comes to selenium, but most people can benefit from the, the supplements or supplementing with zinc and selenium. When we get into gugglesterone, that's a little bit of a different, that's more of the botanical type of thing. So that's an extract or ingredient that I talked about previously. And you're just taking that for, for, for that purpose. It also has other benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits and so on. And then I would say pretty much anything that has a, an anti-inflammatory effect. So that's where we get into the, the area of using omega-3 fatty acids. You could use antioxidants, you, you know, vitamin C, that sort of thing. Any, anything in that sort of area. I mean, I'll use rosemary extract as well. So you can take plant or herbal extracts that are known to have anti-inflammatory effects and you can combine them together to enhance that pathway. So that's really what I'm thinking about. Um, we can talk about dosing and things like that of zinc and selenium if you want to, or just keep it broad. Um, but th those are like, I would say the four broad categories of supplements that you can take to improve thyroid conversion. Before we get into dosing, how about talking about a little bit about the conversion, a lot of it takes place in the liver and gut. Do you right. do things also to support liver or recommend things to support liver? And Yeah. So that's, that's another way to look at it. So you're, you're right. I'm trying to keep it perhaps maybe a little more simple, but I think when you go and see a practitioner, they're going to look at that individual system inside of your body and put this into a whole picture, right? So we're speaking more generally here, but let's say you were, you went into your, your, um, Let's say, you, let's say you were going to see Eric, right? And he's trying to figure out what's going on with you. Why aren't you converting? Well, as, as Eric just said there, a lot of that conversion actually occurs in the gut or occurs, occurs predominantly in the liver. Some occurs in the intestinal tract and then some occurs at the cellular level. So the nutrients that are required at the cellular level are different than those that would be required at the liver and those that would be required at the gut. But what you can do is when you go in and you're being evaluated, you can try and figure out and pinpoint what issue 
is predominantly uh, where, where is the issue in your body? Because it's going to be different for every single person. Some people may have more liver problems because they have insulin resistance. Some people uh, may have problems with detoxification, or maybe they have issues with their bile ducts because perhaps they've had a, uh, their gallbladder removed or something along those lines. Or other people may be suffering from infections in the gut or inflammatory conditions in the gut or leaky gut or intestinal overgrowth or fungal over overgrowth, et cetera. But those are highly individualized. So you kind of have to go into that area and determine if that needs to be um, treated. Now, having said that, there are certain basic things that you can do if we want to just be basic about it with liver health. And that includes things like uh, consuming foods that are high in sulfur, so cruciferous vegetables, using things like milk thistle is part, uh, particularly effective as well. If you just want to take generalized sort of uh, approach there, you can use things like glutathione as well. And then when it comes to the gut health, we can talk about probiotics, prebiotics, um, potentially uh, herbal antivirals, herbal anti, or not antivirals, but herbal antifungals and antibacterial agents. And so it kind of depends on which sort of area you're looking at. But yeah, you're right to point out that the majority of the conversion does occur in the liver um, as well as the gut. And then some occurs peripherally inside of the cellular tissues as well. Thanks for that. And yeah, with dosing, especially selenium, zinc, because you don't want to take too much of either one. So what would be a general dosage that would be recommended? Yeah, good point. So again, you can, you can get highly uh, individualized here as well. But when it comes to zinc, I'm a, I'm a fan of the lowest possible dose of zinc as you can take. So that's somewhere between the order of eight to 10 milligrams is usually what I take, assuming you can take it without food and assuming you can take it from uh, by itself and assuming you're getting the maximum absorption. Now you will find that the majority of zinc does come in higher dosages and you'll have a lot of people who experience nausea and indigestion when using zinc, which is why I recommend those sort of lower dosages. Um, and that maximizes the absorption and minimizes the side effects that can be associated with it. Um, and also it's just repleting the base level that you need. Now, when it comes to selenium, that's a little different. I, I think it's probably safe to say that most people need zinc probably more than they need selenium because selenium, you don't want to go overboard on. I haven't found too many issues in taking you know, 30 to 50 to 60 even milligrams of zinc, even if you don't know what your level is, you just take it. I don't, I haven't seen too many issues with zinc if you're just blindly supplementing. With selenium, that's another story. You can actually run into some problems with selenium toxicity. And so when it comes to that, I tend to tend to lean backwards a little bit. So in the, in the past, I used to recommend higher dosages, probably three to 400 micrograms, especially for patients who had Hashimoto's or autoimmune diseases like Graves. But I've since reined that back in a little bit because I've seen people that have issues. Um, and so I recommend somewhere in the, in the range of 100, let's say 50 to 150 micrograms, 100 to 200 microgram range of selenium. And that should be taken in context with what you are consuming. People are consuming a lot of Brazil nuts because they're known to have a high, they're known to be a high source of selenium. Now, the problem is there's a lot of issues related to the content of, of selenium inside of Brazil nuts, which can vary wildly, depends on where it was harvested and you know the size of the Brazil nut and so on. And then also a lot of these things because of the keto diet, I think they're, these sort of nuts have been brought to prominence. And so you have a lot more people consuming more Brazil nuts than, they, than I think they know how much selenium is in, contained inside of them. So if you accidentally took five or six even Brazil nuts in one day, you could you know potentially get up to the five to 600 microgram dose range of selenium combined with whatever supplements you're taking. All of a sudden, I mean, you could pretty easily get up to 900 to even 1000 micrograms of selenium per day, which is clearly more than you would want to be taking. So I do recommend that you proceed cautiously when it comes to selenium. If you stay in that lower dose range and you eliminate the, the massive sources such as Brazil nuts, um, I think that's okay. I prefer to recommend using selenium in supplement form because it allows you to titrate that dose, right? There's a lot of variability between your Brazil nuts. So one might have 40 micrograms, one might have 90, you know? And so it's like, okay, you think you're getting hundred, but you could be getting twice that or, or half that. You, it's, it's really hard to know. And so if you are using a supplement form, you can really fine tune and titrate it and be like, well, I took hundred micrograms today or for the last month and I, I, you know, I'm monitoring my progress. I'm looking at my symptoms. I'm looking at my lab tests. How do I feel? And so on. So it's just a little easier to monitor in that way. Um, did we talk about anything other than zinc and selenium in terms of dosage or, or was that it? Did your question uh, and you, 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 you just, you just mentioned the, the doses for zinc and selenium. If okay. you want to mention the other two that you, the other, those are, those are kind of variable. So, um, gogosterone and, and the anti-inflammatory omega. Yeah. We, those doses just kind of vary. So I, I won't go into those in, in detail, okay. but yeah, I would say probably more important for thyroid patients are zinc and selenium and, and just not overdoing on those two areas. Yeah. And then one thing to add with the selenium, of course, if you're also taking a multivitamin that right. probably has selenium as well. So besides the Brazil nut consumption, if you're taking a multivitamin, some, some multivitamins will have up to 200 micrograms of Absolutely. selenium too. And then if you're taking a separate 200 micrograms supplement of selenium and you're eating Brazil nuts on top of that, you, you can get way up there. Into trouble. 
So, yeah. yeah. And, and that's how I think about it. Um, but like you said, just take, so, just take stock of what you're taking. Look in the back, make sure you're not overdoing on any selenium. I take this into context, like when I'm formulating supplements and adding them together. So I, I think it's really important not to take too much, but I will say uh, it was sort of previously, if you go back maybe five to six years or so, I think a lot of practitioners were recommending that 400 microgram dose range. So I think that was pretty popular back in the day. And I think there was a, at least one study that I know of that said, Hey, look, you can take up to this amount or you can take up to 400 to 500 micrograms of selenium and not run into toxicity issues. But I think that just assumes that selenium from all sources. So as Eric was saying, make sure you look on the back of every single one of your bottles, make sure there's no excess or hidden selenium in there and also take stock of what you're eating that may contain high doses of selenium, which is predominantly Brazil nuts. If we're, if we're, you know, talking about meaningful sources. What magnesium, even though that you didn't mention, you mentioned magnesium yeah. earlier, but if someone's right. taken magnesium, what dosage would you recommend for, for that? So I, I'm a big fan of magnesium. Magnesium is one of those uh, for thyroid function, which can be impacted predominantly from the, uh, from, predominantly in the kidneys. And so I personally recommend usually in the 150 to 300 milligram dose range. Um, now, which type of, which type of magnesium you use really depends on the problem and what you're trying to treat though, because you can use much higher doses of magnesium if you wanted to, especially if you're trying to use it in a form of magnesium citrate um, and you're using it for gut health or constipation. You could be using it predominantly for depression. If you have someone um, who is suffering from brain fog or depression related to their thyroid, that's a different form of magnesium. You could, if you're just trying to get into the body, that's a different form. So it really sort of depends on which form you're talking about uh, and how you're trying to get it into the body and what purpose you're trying to sort of obtain there. Now, I will say more generally though, I've included that more broadly uh, for people to take because I think you know, you and I even, well, you have Graves disease. I don't have a thyroid problem, but I would still recommend magnesium in someone like me, um, you know, probably in somebody like you as well, because I think it gets depleted a lot in stress. And since we're all under a lot of stress, we all tend to benefit from using magnesium. It also just helps lubricate the bowels. It's just a really good overall supplement to take. And I would say, yeah, somewhere, if you don't know where to start, somewhere between that 150, 300 milligram dose range, but you can always exercise uh, dosing based off of bowel tolerance. So if you take it and you notice you're getting some indigestion or you know you're know you noticing your stools are becoming a little more loose, back up on your dose, it's not that hard. You can you can kind of manipulate it that way. I don't know, what what, what about, what dosing do you tend to recommend for magnesium or do you? Yeah, no, I do recommend uh, magnesium and I agree the, the form, it, it varies. Sometimes I'll recommend magnesium citrate. Sometimes I'll recommend, right. you know, magnesium malate or, right. you know, gl magnesium glycinate, I commonly right. recommend. So, so it really yeah. does does depend on the situation. And, and typically the dose, I would say probably the average would be, I mean, anywhere between 150 and 400 milligrams. About so the same, they, yeah. I mean, there are some cases where you could justify taking higher doses, but if we're talking about average with the average person yeah. needs, uh, most people don't need to take, I don't think more than 400 milligrams, but again, there's always, always exceptions. Yeah. And I, I, I would recommend if you're, if you're listening to this as a, as a patient and you're trying to figure out what to take, some of these things that we're talking about are incredibly safe to take. You don't really need to worry about too much in terms of side effects. Well, I've mentioned selenium that you can potentially go toxic. We mentioned iodine that you can potentially cause problems, but I, I don't know about you, but I've never seen anybody take magnesium and really have a significant problem. So if, if you're wondering about taking magnesium, it's, it's as far as safety goes, uh, it's, it's a pretty safe supplement to, to use and to take. Yeah, I agree. Usually if, if someone does take too much, they might get some loose stools. That's about it. Yeah. And, and other than that, but yeah, it's selenium and also iron. You don't want to, iron. which Good is another point. reason why you want to test for, which we discussed yeah. earlier. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I should have actually mentioned this. Some of these nutrients requ absolutely require testing prior to you, prior to taking. Iron is absolutely one of those. Iron, you can go toxic on. You can actually have iron overload syndromes. Uh, hemochromatosis is the genetic version of that. And a lot of people suffer from that, um, which is actually quite common as well. So iron, iodine, potentially, depending on the situation and the dose that you're trying to use, selenium potentially as well. But some of them, I don't think you really need to. Even, even the magnesium, the serum magnesium testing in the RBC magnesium, they're not super accurate to begin with. So, you know, that that's variable as well. And some people, you might be using it for a completely separate purpose. Maybe you're more interested in, in its effects on the bowels than you are its in, intracellular effects. So you could be using it for some phys physiologic purpose such as that, in which case the serum levels don't matter quite as much. So I, I take a lot of liberties in terms of how I use these and what I test for and what is the purpose of using the supplement. So that, again, that's just how I think about it that, you know, may not drive with other practitioners, but I've, I found good success using it, supplements in these ways. How about you, you mentioned earlier B complex. So you, you think most people can benefit from a B complex? I do. Uh, so I will tell you, I'll tell you a little story. Um, when I was practicing, so this was how it's 2021. So this was probably four or five years ago. One thing that I would universally do, and it was just phenomenal, is I would give pretty much every thyroid patient that walked in a B12 shot. 
And so I'd give it to them in a methylcobalamin form, 5,000 micrograms. So very, very, very high dose. I mean, relative, right? Relative to the RDA. And I would give it to them. And you wouldn't believe the improvement that these people would see using B12 shots over even sublingual and oral, oral forms of B12. And so I really learned from that uh, this essentially lesson that thyroid patients, especially just do really, really well on supra physiologic dosages, especially of B12 and other B, B vitamins. And so that was just something I saw clinically. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's no data. There's no science to prove that this is the case. In fact, when you actually look at the data, people will say that supplemental forms such as oral and, and sublingual forms, they're not superior to B to B12 shots, but that doesn't jive with what I saw clinically. I just, people would come back and they'd be begging me for more, more shots. Like they would just want more and more and more. So I, I don't know if it has to do with how it gets into the cells, if it maybe goes directly into the muscle cells and perhaps is providing mitochondrial energy in that way. I don't know. I'm just, just, you know, spitballing here in terms of it's why it works or potentially why it may work differently than oral. But I do believe that thyroid patients, at least in the low thyroid patient uh, population, which I can't imagine that it's is untrue for the hyperthyroid patients. They just respond fantastically well to B12, specifically sh shots, but honestly, anything. They could, they could use sublingual B12 or oral capsules as well. And then uh, the same sort of concept, if, you're, if, you are, if you are low in one of the B vitamins, the, the same triggers would cause the other B vitamins to become lower as well. They're, they're, they tend to be water soluble as a family with the exception of one. And so they tend to kind of go together. If, one, if you're low in one, you're probably going to be low in the others, which is why multivitamins can be very beneficial. You know, whatever habits that you are doing, stress or poor diet or, you know, eating, eating food that's processed or refined, these things are going to deplete your nutrients. They're not just going to deplete one, they're going to deplete several. And then also the thing about the thyroid function is it has specific impacts on your intestinal tract as well. So it causes decrease absorption of things like B12 and iron specifically. So these people need more of these, these nutrients compared to the average population. If we're talking just about thyroid patients. And lastly, you know, another thing is you can actually have autoimmune diseases of the intestinal tract, which result in further impairment of uh, B12 absorption as well. And because Graves disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism and Hashimoto's is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. And we know these autoimmune diseases tend to go together. You're more likely to have it from thyroid function, but from uh, the autoimmune perspective, and then also from just my own clinical experience and seeing the benefit there. So I, yeah, I highly recommend B12 shots if possible, but if you can't get that, then you go for the sublingual or the capsule form. I do see slightly better uh, clinical improvement with sub sublingual versus capsule, but I still think capsule are, are great. And it's harder to get a lot of the other B complexes inside of the sublingual version. So you're usually just getting B12. So that's something to consider. So yeah, and, and honestly, I don't have a thyroid problem, but I use B12 shots periodically as well. And I, I you know, you say it's placebo, I don't know what it is, but I absolutely feel amazing. And uh, after I get them, so I, I haven't actually had one in a while, but this conversation reminded me, I'm going to go get one uh, when I go home. <laughs> have you ever okay. tried B12 shots, Eric? I have not. I've not had a B12 shot ever. So, so I, I, I might want, have to run out and get one. Go run out and get one. So if anyone's listening, you can go to uh, weight loss clinics usually, but you got to make sure it's in the methylcobalamin form. I mean, we could have gone into so much detail in terms of, you know, uh, methylated versions of, of B complexes and so on, but you want to make sure, especially as a thyroid patient, you're getting a methylated version of it. Um, so, or you can get other forms, just don't get cyanocobalamin for many mm -hmm. other, for many reasons we won't talk about right now, but yep. it, cyan, it needs to be metabolic. The, the cyano component can be metabolized as cyanide and cause thyroid problems. So get the methylcobalamin version. Um, and if you're looking for doses, dosages anywhere from 1000 micrograms to 5,000 micrograms once per week. So that's usually the, the range that I recommend, but yeah, go, go get one. Eric. I, th I think you'll like it. Yeah, I'll need to definitely give that a try. Yeah. How about supplements? Are there any supplements specifically that you recommend for people with hyperthyroidism, Graves disease? Hyperthyroidism, I tend to take a more broad approach uh, in the sense that I look at, let's look at immune function and then let's look at like general systems that I see people mostly have problems with. So I have a hyperthyroid bundle that I will sometimes uh, recommend to people who have hyperthyroidism. But if you want to get more fine tuned, then you'll need to go see someone like Eric who can then say, okay, we need to add this probiotic. Maybe you also need this, this antifungal or this, you know, antibacterial agent or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, so there's some general things. So multivitamin for sure. I'm not afraid of using iodine. I think I, I mentioned that to you previously. So I do include that in there just as a, at a low dose. I also am a big fan of supporting adrenal health because I think regardless of the thyroid status, excess adrenal or, or I'm sorry, excess thyroid function or low thyroid function, you still have tax it, taxing that occurs at the level of the adrenal function and can result in fatigue, even though you're, you're feeling that wired sensation that can occur with hyperthyroidism. Um, and then also gut health, I think is uh, definitely important. So that's how I look at hyperthyroidism. And then from there, we can kind of go down and do those other things that we mentioned previously. You can focus on different systems, liver health, gut health, and so on. But yeah, I would say those are the, the general supplements for hyperthyroidism and Graves disease. Oh, I forgot to actually mention in there too, you want to focus on the immune system, which would include things like vitamin D as well, um, zinc, and even omega-3 fatty acids, I think do, most hyperthyroid patients tend to do really well on those things. 
I agree. I, I give pretty much every one of my patients, whether they have Hashimoto's or Graves, uh, omega-3 fatty acid yeah. and vitamin D, of course, I'll test first. And most people are deficient in, yeah. in vitamin D. We, we and, should, do, are, are we, do we have time to talk about vitamin D or we sure. running short on time? Well, I, I will say this about vitamin D. So, so yeah, absolutely test vitamin D. I don't know about you, but in, in my history and testing, I found a handful of people that ever come up normal. Like, is that, has that been your experience who aren't already supplementing? Like, let me say that. Uh, every now and then it's, it's rare for people who aren't taking it, but yeah, I can say that I haven't seen anybody who's normal, who's not taking vitamin D. That's been my experience as well. And so vitamin D is one of those things where a lot of people know it's important, but they don't quite understand how important that it is. And it's also difficult to, I shouldn't say difficult, but a lot of people tend to not want to supplement it with it so much because it's hard to experience, um, some sort of clinical benefit when you take it, right? You're taking the supplement and you're like, oh, my numbers went up, but how did I feel? Did it, did it really help me? You know? Um, whereas if you're taking an adrenal supplement, let's say you're taking uh, ashwagandha or rhodiola or ginseng or whatever it is, uh, or maca root even, a lot of people notice some benefit, you know, fairly rapidly. And they'll be able to tell this thing is helping me with my libido. This thing is helping me with my energy. This thing is helping me sleep, et cetera. So it's easier to take something if you notice the improvement, but that vitamin D level is so important. Having said that, uh, and I, I'm, I'm with Eric on this as well. I, I don't think I've seen maybe one person who is not supplementing with vitamin D already. And I live in Arizona. I'm not sure. Wh where do you live? In North Carolina. North Carolina. Okay. North Carolina. So I, I guess we're probably fairly similar. You should have a lot of sunny days there. It should be enough yep. that you could get sufficient vitamin D through your sun latitude wise. But it's just so common that it's, that it's deficient. Now, I will say it's pretty easy to, to take a vitamin D supplement you want in the D3 form and to get the right dosing, but you will want to test. But I still recommend, if possible, that you get it through the natural route. I think that that's far more beneficial. It's beneficial from the circadian rhythm point of view. It's beneficial for the skin. Um, it's it's a just much more beneficial if you can get it the all-natural route. Now, depending on where you live, if you're too far north, depending on what time of year that it is, uh, depending on how much cloud cover you have, depending on whether or not you use sunblock or suntan lotion, whatever it is, it may not be possible. So if that's the case, then you definitely want to supplement. But if you do want to get it the all natural way, you can do that. You want to be out sort of the rules of thumb to do this is you want to have 40% of your body or your skin exposed. You don't want to have any sort of uh, suntan blocking lotion on. You want to be out where your shadow is shorter than you are. So if you walk outside and your shadow casts a shadow that's 10 feet long and you're six feet tall, that's the wrong time of the, the day that you want to get that sun exposure. So it usually needs to be between the hours of noon and about 2 p.m. 40% of the skin exposed, no suntan lotion, and the skies must be clear. You must not have any, any uh, clouds that are blocking the, the sun cover. And if you can go out and you spend about 20 minutes out there, uh, you can get a significant amount of your vitamin D through the sun. And as I mentioned before, that, that light that comes into your eyes, this is all beneficial to your circadian rhythm. It can help you with sleep. And this is, you know, I, a, the best way to get vitamin D is that method. If you can't, or if you want to rapidly get it up for whatever reason, then you can use the vitamin D3 formulation. You can take it that way. Usually in drops, the mycelized version tends to be best. And anywhere from, I would say, 1,000 micrograms all the way up to, or I use all the way up to 5,000. But I've seen some people need as high as 10,000. But that's something you're going to have to just sort of play around with with your, with your uh, doctor or whoever's helping you out with that. So I just want to mention that on vitamin D. Yeah, I agree. And thank you. Yeah, I agree. If you can get, I mean, not that you can't get some benefits from the sun, but you know, yeah, try to get as much naturally, just like with, from a nutrient standpoint, you want to try exactly. to get as much from the food as possible. One other question with vitamin D, if when someone supplements, do you recommend vitamin K2 to go along with the, the I, D3? I used to, I used to recommend that uh, universally. Um, and I just don't really see a lot of clinical benefit or utility in doing that. So I've, I've since stopped recommending that. Um, I usually only recommend the K2 if I know that they have some sort of specific issue related to either um, osteoporosis or bone health specifically, or even cardiovascular issues. So most of the people that would come to me did not have either of those issues. And I thought it just brought up the, the, the price of the, the vitamin D3 and I saw very little benefit benefit from doing that. So I didn't. Um, personally, I don't frequently recommend it. I used to do it a lot. Every single person that would come in, it was like, you get this and you get K2, D3, K2, right? That, that combo. But again, I just didn't really see a lot of that benefit. So I stopped doing that uh, personally. But if you want to do it, go for it. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. K2 is incredibly uh, a beneficial nutrient and it can be added even if you just want general health. But um, yeah, w what's your opinion on the K2 situation? Yeah, I, I have been recommending it for a number of years just because uh, I, I was taught that it helps to guide the calcium into the bone and Same, yeah. you know whether everybody needs the k2 you know i, I don't know that it, the, unfortunately it's not really a good way to test for a k2 but no from what i also have learned and researched that it is fairly safe that it, you know it is. You, you can't really overdose with k2 so i guess it's really just a play it safe mechanism if someone's taking d3 you know it's a usually i get recommended d3 k2 supplements combo 
just mm-hmm. uh, just to make sure that they're getting the calcium got into the bone. Again, whether they need it or not, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know if any practitioner really knows, but but yeah, so that's the approach I take. Yeah, and I think I, I try to use the, the fewest amount of supplements to get the biggest bang for the buck, right? And so when it comes to that, I do think you see diminishing returns once people start taking eight, nine, 10, 12. I mean, I've seen people taking 20 plus supplements, right? And so at that point, it's like, what is the expense of this every month? How, how, how feasible is it to get all of these inside of your body? What sort of benefit are you getting? Are you having interactions between the two? Are you preventing absorption of certain nutrients? You know, it, we get into really complex situations when you start taking a bunch. So if I don't see the clinical utility of it right away or not right away, but over a time, then I would, I, I'm more hesitant to, to recommend it because I, I think to myself, well, what if we took out that and added something else in, in addition to it? Would you get more benefit if, for instance, we use rhodiola in, in place of k2 or, or you know something like that so that's sort of the philosophy that i would take when looking at everything but but as you mentioned there's nothing wrong with taking k2 i think a lot of people pre- prefer to take it especially with some of those studies which are very convincing i will say but i just I, again i just haven't seen clinical benefit personally but it also depends on the age range of the population in which you are helping so i don't know what what type of age range you're looking at but predominantly the the age range and the gender that I would see that needed the most help, most help was somewhere between women ages 30 to 45. And these women tend to not experience any sort of issues with cardiovascular problems or bone density issues until postmenopausal. And so we're talking at least 15, 20 years away from that sort of issue. So you know, maybe, maybe that's similar in terms of the age, age range that you're seeing. I'm not sure, but that I think would also play a role. Okay. And it varies. I, I do see... I would say probably the a- average, it's a pretty wide range, anywhere from like 30 to 60 is the, okay. the range I see. I yeah, would say a good good amount of younger women and uh, mo- mostly women. I see men too, but most people would, as you know, Same. Graves, Hashimoto's tend to be women. So yeah. probably like 80 to 90% of my patient base is women. So, yeah. but either way, so th- in the 30s, uh, I see, and then, I mean, some in the, the 20s and some teens, but but on average, I'd say 30 to 60, which is a pretty, I know it's a pretty broad range. Can I ask you one more question? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So do do you think that a multivitamin is necessary or would you recommend a multivitamin in most people with Graves and Hashimoto's? So good question. Uh, Complicated answer. So I I would say, look, this is how I look at it. When I was actually treating people and practicing, I would rarely ever recommend multivitamins, but that's because I was able to more fine tune exactly what that person needed. Now, if you are not seeing a general practitioner, and I think most people are probably seeing subpar practitioners. I, I meant no offense to any anyone out there, you know, endocrinologists and so on or whatever. But they're just not going to have that sort of knowledge to to give them the direction that they, they need. So, generally speaking, I think most patients, Graves, Hashimoto's, hypothyroid pa- patients in general, would benefit from a multivitamin, and I would recommend it, with the exception of those people who are perhaps seeing somebody like you who understands the nuances and who could you know directly guide it and create concoct this you know a a special set of uh, nutrients and supplements and vitamins and botanicals and herbs that would be specific for that purpose or for that person. But in the absence of that, then it's better to use that than not at all. That, that's at least how I would look at it. But you can do a lot on your own. So I would say, I would say if you're a thyroid patient listening to this, whether you have Graves, Hashimoto's, et cetera, spend some time reading about reading and researching. And if you just pay attention to your body, if you try these things and experiment a little bit, stay away from some of the more, you know, things that we talked about previously that can potentially cause harm. But if you, you can do a lot on your own, and I don't think you should necessarily be too scared to do that. Um, I think you can get a lot of improvement. And a lot of this is going to come down to the severity of your illness as well. So there are going to be some people who, no matter how, you know, there's always a spectrum in terms of the severity of the disease. I'll put my hands here so you can actually see. But you know, you might have somebody who's on this this side, which is relatively easily treatable, and maybe just some things like a probiotic, omega threes. You know, changing your lifestyle up a little bit, eating even just whole foods, removing your fast food. That may be sufficient. I've seen that. That may be sufficient for you to see significant improvement. By the time you've tried these things and you don't see improvement, you're going to need to see somebody like Eric because you're going to have to go and progress into more complicated diets. You're going to have to look for infections in the in the gut. You're going to have to look at liver health and insulin resistance and so on. Um, um, but yeah, I would say generally speaking, I think most people could benefit from a multivitamin, uh, regardless of thyroid status, broadly speaking. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing. And any any other last words as far as supplementation goes that for those with thyroid, autoimmune thyroid conditions? No, I, I don't think there's any last words. Um, I would say I would say the thing that I would leave everybody with is that um, I want to I always want to get a point across that or get the point across that to empower thyroid patients to do a lot of the research and learning on their own. And I think I think it could be very frustrating for a lot of patients when they're unable to or unable to get um, 
certain treatments and medications, but just realize that there's a wide array of supplements, botanicals and herbs and so on that you can use and they're available over the counter. Um, they're not all equally as good and they're not necessarily going to be the key to helping you uh, by themselves, but I think they can be used in conjunction, especially when used with medications and so on. And that's kind of my preferred method. Use this with diet, use this with lifestyle, use this with, with all the things that we've talked about thus far. And I, th I think that doing it that way, I think a lot of people could benefit from, from the use of supplements. All right. Well, awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks again for sharing everything. Thanks for your time. And where can people learn more about you? Yeah, I would say if, if this information, if you found it interesting, um, I just check out my website. If you just search my name, Dr. Weston Childs, uh, I, you can go there. And if you type in Dr. Weston Childs, start here. I have a list of eight different resources that you can download. Uh, downloading them will put you on my email list. So we have tons of information, uh, things like full, full and complete set of lab tests, foods to avoid, um, lists that you, clinical studies you can take to your doctor to try and uh, promote getting um, the right type of treatment and so on. So uh, tons of downloads that I recommend that you check out there. And you can type in my name, Dr. Weston Child, start here. Um, and yeah, I, I would go there if you if you like the, what you're hearing here. And same thing with YouTube. If they visit YouTube yeah. and type in Dr. Weston Childs, they'll uh, find I'll, you that way too. I'll pop up. Yeah. Just type in my name and you'll see YouTube, website, podcast, et cetera. So wh wh whatever your fancy is, there's something there for you. Yeah. And of course, I'll include links in the, in the show notes. Cool. And uh, thanks, Weston. Appreciate everything that you've uh, shared with, uh, with the listeners and uh, hope to have you back again in the future. Awesome. I'd love, I'd love to do that.